All right. Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Um, uh, when you talk about trying to find a way to navigate the environment we're in and, and diplomatically, what role is there for Australia to speak up about human rights, including in Hong Kong and Xinjiang? And how can Australia raise those issues in a way that doesn't inflame the situation? I mean, what is your perspective on how we can go about continuing to stand by those values? Yeah, and this is an, this is an eternal question in dealing with China. Um, and it hasn't become any worse. Some problems may very well have become worse. But how you deal with uh, China, which takes a different approach to the human rights discussions than we do, is a perennial problem. We did have, from the late 90s through to a couple of years ago, when part of the measures against us saw it dropped, an annual bilateral human rights dialogue. When I was Deputy Secretary, I chaired that for about three years in a row. Um, you know, we'd get beaten up in, 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 in the Senate by, because we couldn't sort of produce concrete immediate results. But my feeling is, and if you think of when we first started that dialogue, there was progressively change and improvement in China's human rights conformance. Um, I mean, one delegation I led was on the human rights of HIV and AIDS sufferers. That was like 2004 or five. At that time, you couldn't even discuss uh, homosexuality or same sex. And yet, uh, now it's commonplace and measures have been taken to protect, a long time ago, to protect the rights of HIV and AIDS sufferers. So, you know, you can't do a clean sweep. It's never going to be that way. But you are better having platforms and capacity to engage and talk rather than just be shouting at each other through megaphones. So you're saying doing it quietly and not speaking publicly about those things? Well, uh, you've got to do both. But the public stuff, you have to work out how and when you do it. And Less frequently. Circumstances. Sorry? Less frequently, you say. Well, not on every issue. I think like a lot of issues where you'll have problems with managing China, uh, you need to pick the issues, the ones that, that really matter, or the ones that you think public statement, in good company with other countries, uh, may have uh, an impact and be heard. I mean, the main thing with diplomacy is not how loudly you speak, but the outcomes you get. Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from the West Australian. Obviously in WA, state government and industry are pretty annoyed at how the uh, relationship is being handled federally with China. What can it feasibly, the state and the state government, do about that? Is it important that it keeps speaking out vocally as it is and hitting out at the federal government in this way? Or does it need to change its tack, given that Francis Addison only recently said that China wants to see um, as divided in Australia as possible? Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't know if that's China's position or not, but in terms of how state governments deal with this, it's like the business community. I think that state governments and the business community have allowed themselves uh, their interests to become delegitimised in this highly polarised China debate that we're having in Australia at present. As I said, I mean, uh, what you've just said you know, frames it as um, sycophancy or hostility. And it, it, it never was like that. It doesn't have to be like that. It's an artificial construction for the discussion. Um, but what's happened is that industry uh, uh, or business, when it speaks about its interest in the relationship, uh, now there's a, there's, there's a phalanx of government officials, ministers and, um, and journalists who say, oh, they're just talking their own uh, book and they're only looking after their own self-interest. Well, guess what? The foundation of national security is economic security. And China maybe contributes 10% of GDP or something. You know, last time I looked, Australia's GDP. Sure, you could do without that. But we're going to be a less, not only a poorer country, but a less secure country. So I do think the case has to be made much more careful, much, much more forcefully by state governments and business that this is not just about the interest of one particular company or one particular state, fundamental to Australia's security is a strong, dynamic economy. And whether we like it or not, that's the world we live in. Whether we like it or not, China is the fastest growing economy in the world, that there's 1.4 billion of them, that they have a per capita income today of 15,000 US dollars spread over 1.4 billion people. 
and that it's the dominant economic power in our region. And no one's going to replace China in any of our lifetimes unless China implodes or collapses. So I just think self-interest for the country is served by ensuring we have strong uh, and cooperative economic relations with China. Glenda Corporal. Um, if, as um, uh, we've discussed the change of administration in the US, how much do you think um, that right-wing elements in the US, uh, could be um, Pompeo, Pence, have been pressuring Australia to become um, a bit of a deputy sheriff and speaking up and making, making points which might have suited those, um, might have suited cer certain right-wing influences in the US? Um, just secondly, one other question. BRI, Victoria has signed up to the BRI. What is it? What have they signed? It's pretty innocuous, but the, the um, Morrison government is wanting to pass legislation to stop states doing that. I mean, what do you, what do you feel about that? And a third question, we talked about the role of business, but the, the National Party, I mean, we've got farmers, the huge farm exports to, uh, to China. We've got barley, the West Australian barley interests have virtually stopped. We've got beef interest stop. We've got wine interest stop. Um, where is the National Party in this debate? When you know, in earlier times, you've had people like Doug Anthony, Ian Sinclair going to China. Um, where is the National Party in terms of discussing these interests? Thank you. Thanks. Well, I, 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 maybe I'll maybe I'll start at the end and work from the front. But uh, on the last one, I can't help but just speaking about Doug Anthony and Blackjack McEwen and all of those legends from the Country Party. That of course it was in 1961 that uh, the Country Party uh, forced the uh, government to um, uh, uh, sell, uh, to allow wheat from Australia to be sold to China, breaking the US imposed grain embargo on China. Um, and so we stepped outside the US pressure at that time and we broke uh, that embargo. And that really was so. Um, so uh, uh, that, and, well, it certainly stopped starvation, which was happening, but it was uh, economic interest of the National Party at the time to sell grain to China. And when I first met Vice Premier Yali, Yowie Lin, who was one of the sort of legends of um, Chinese Communist Party leadership, it was with Ralph Willis, who was visiting China in 1987. Yowie Lin was more or less gaga by that time, right? And we go to meet him, and... Uh, but he said, he said, he said to Ralph Willis, who was uh, Labor Minister at the time, I remember Australia, you supplied us grain in 1961 when we were starving. So there are, there's important history around all of this. Where it is today, I've got no idea, Glenda. Um, on, <laughs> the second one, the, 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 the first one was um, uh, Pompeo. Yeah, Pompeo clearly is trying to whistle up all the, the troops that have been busy around the world. Uh, Forcing the U.S. Uh, the U.K. to fin you know, finally uh, finally ban all of Huawei, not just 70% of it or whatever. Um, he's been out, you know, with very aggressive statements about regime change in China, um, and I don't really hear a lot of Australian government officials or ministers distancing themselves from some of those statements. So I think uh, we'll have to see who the new Secretary of State is. And what was your second one, sir? Yeah, right. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. I don't know if uh, the government intends or can uh, implement retrospective legislation and force uh, Victoria to tear up what it's already signed. I didn't think, with our understanding of the rule of law, uh, retrospective legislation was something that we uh, embraced. Um, but on the broader question about foreign affairs powers, if the um, federal government feels quite legitimately that somehow... Um, the powers are clarified, and they do reside with the Commonwealth Government, um, then sure, pass legislation to clear up any ambiguity, do it. Um, no problem with that. What's interesting then, if it is about states' rights and the Constitution, then it's curious that this is being handled by DFAT and not by Prime Minister and Cabinet, because Pri Prime Minister and Cabinet handles uh, COAG and relations with states. So that's a question that hasn't been asked and I haven't seen anyone talk about it. That was a spectacular debut. Three questions in one hit. Tim Shaw, don't follow. <laughs> I promise, Sabra. Thank you. Tim Shaw, Director of the National Press Club, Mr Roby, thank you. Can I take you back to the 2017 uh, Foreign Policy White Paper? 
uh, the department said, and I quote, we encourage China to, to exercise its power in a way that enhances stability, reinforces international law and respects the interests of smaller countries and their right to pursue them peacefully. Uh, Beijing read those words. What were they thinking about that reflection of Australian government policy at the time? How are they thinking now? Sorry, Tim, just get back to the first part. The, the, the that we encourage China to... Sorry, I can't to, do two things at once. Sorry. Yeah, we encourage China to exercise its power in the way that en enhances stability, reinforces international law and respects the interests of smaller countries and their right to pursue them peacefully. Hmm. Beijing read that. What would they have taken from that and how are they thinking about that now? Oh, well, I, I mean, I, I, I think as the words say, I mean, Beijing would understand that small countries have these concerns and uh, small countries need a rule of law. My, my problem with all this discussion about rule of law is that it's become cliched. Um, and there are many international laws. There's not a single rule of international law. And if we, quite rightly, are upset about the hate judgment uh, on China and that they're not following the hate judgment, then... Um, that's fine, but it also has to be pointed out that the US is not a member of UNCLOS, the law of the sea. So it's not party to it. So it's not a rule of law that applies to the United States. Um, so I think you know, we need to be careful not to just talk about rule of law as if it was something uh, understood by everyone um, and, not, and, and, and be very careful that it doesn't become used in self-serving ways. And I think often that would be a, a Beijing reaction to those sorts of statements.